Greetings, and welcome to another edition of Montpelier Connection. I'm State Representative Mike Merwicki, and I represent the Wyndham Ford District of Putney, Dummerston, and Westminster. And here we are getting ready for another legislative session, 2017. Today's guests are two of your representatives here in Brattleboro, Representative Molly Burke and Val Stewart. Welcome. Thanks. Nice to be here. Thanks, Mike, for having us. Thanks for taking the time to come, and congratulations on your reelection. Um, we certainly had some, some good news in Vermont elections. Uh, we won't go into the, the other elections, um, but looking forward to getting started, getting to work. Um, now, Molly, last year you were on the Transportation Committee. Uh, is that what you're hoping to do again this year? I am hoping to do that. Yeah. I sort of have a passion for yeah. transportation because it intersects with so many other issues of, of accessibility and safety. Uh, it's, um, I'm hoping to continue the work that I've been doing on bicycle and pedestrian and accessible safety and uh, other, other aspects of the transportation and infrastructure. How do we, how do we have adequate infrastructure that serves all people? Now, uh, one of the big concerns I heard talking to constituents uh, is global, global warming. Uh, how does that touch your committee? That's one of the things that made me want to be on the Transportation Committee eight years ago, is that I've been concerned about that for a long time, noticing in our town, in Brattleboro, just the sort of increase in, in vehicles, single occupancy vehicles. I think that we need to rethink how we transport ourselves. And there've been a lot of people who've been working on this issue. AARP a number of years ago, put out, it had a conference called Transporting the Public, and they were saying we need to have more public transit, et cetera, because as people age, and we are an aging state, uh, people need to have transportation options. Not everybody's going to want to or be able to drive a car. So there's that aspect of it. There's also the public health aspect of it. If you, not, people aren't just driving their cars a mile or two, which is very, uh, apparently the, the, the um, frequency of people drive more in shorter distances. That's sort of how we're using our, our transportation, our, yeah. our vehicles. So there's public health, there's, there's health of the planet. And we need to really wean ourselves off of the, the automobile. Yeah. And yet we need it to get around. So you know, there are, there are a, lot of, a lot of different options. You know, there's now the whole idea of, uh, of um, self-driving vehicles. And nobody would actually own a vehicle, you just call it up and so maybe there'd be fewer vehicles driving around. I don't know, just mm -hmm. we're sort of in interesting times, yeah. but we do need to think about the, the greenhouse gas aspect of transportation. Yeah. So that's something I'm always promoting in our committee. I think when we look at Vermont's um, carbon footprint, vehicle use is, is the biggest percentage of it, isn't it? Well, transportation in general, 47% of Vermont's greenhouse gases come from the transportation sector. Yeah. So, and it's a very hard nut to crack, yeah. as we know. Yeah. Well, something to work on. I know one right. of the it's things- It's always good to have things to work on. We're, we're happy to have our park and ride in Putney, and now the idea is to get more ride sharing, and that's the easiest way, isn't it? It's low hanging fruit. Yeah. Very, uh, the most um, cost effective way to reduce, have instead of two people driving from Putney to Brattleboro, you have one vehicle, two people. Yeah. So things like that make a lot of sense. They don't cost a lot of money. Yeah, they do. Wow. Now, Val, you were serving on the uh, Economic Development Committee. Right. And is that something you're hoping to be yes. assigned to as well? Yes, I'm hoping that I will again be able to stay on the Economic Development and Commerce Committee and um, yeah, do a second term in that committee. Uh, I really enjoyed the work there. Are there things you're looking ahead to, perhaps that didn't get finished last year and uh, hoping to pick up work on this year? Yeah, well, I think um, it, the independent contractor issue will definitely come up again uh, this coming year. And I hope that all the good work we did last year, which got derailed at the very end of the session, will be factored into a new bill that will hopefully see the light of day. So uh, I think that would be really important for the health of our economy and uh, for the, all the people who are independent contractors out there. And, and there was uh, a lot of 
sticking points over the definition. Is that what? Yeah, the definition was the thing that we really couldn't nail down. We thought we had gotten it nailed down. We did a ton of work on it, and um, but it just um, at the very end it got uh, derailed by uh, one person really <laughs> on the floor who uh, wanted to send the whole thing back to committee. So um, that was unfortunate. But hopefully. We'll We'll move that forward. Um, some of the other things we're going to be working on is uh, the Vermont Economic Growth Incentive, uh, which really, uh, to date, has done a great job of creating job opportunities for Vermonters, but um, it really is most advantageous to businesses that are uh, uh, 50 people or above, and as I'm sure you're well aware, over 90% of the businesses in Vermont are under 50 people. So um, we're hoping that we will be able to develop um, some, uh, there really aren't that many small business um, growth programs, and we're going to try to figure out um, how to make small business programs more accessible so that smaller businesses can grow and thrive in Vermont. and. Uh, uh, small businesses employ over 50% of Vermonters, so uh, if we can grow that area, that would be really great. Now, one of the concerns across the board we have in Vermont is as an a aging population in right. the state, yeah. uh, how do we attract and keep younger yeah. people here? Is that something that your committee has been looking uh, at? We have been looking at that, and we actually did allocate a lot, but you know, a lot for Vermont, $200,000 for a marketing program, and part of that marketing program is targeted to uh, bring new people into the state. We need to grow our younger population uh, because of the demographics, of our aging demographics of our state, uh, which is, uh, and growing our youth demographic is important to uh, all rural states are having this problem. It's not just Vermont. So uh, we have a marketing program that uh, last year was put together, and I'm sure we're going to be looking at how they're doing at attracting young professionals and people who have uh, entrepreneurial ideas, maybe want to found businesses in our state uh, to come here. So we are going to be working on that again this year. Now, now if Curtis Reed were here, yes, uh, he'd probably suggest that there's a, a great pool of talent for our, our workforce uh, in, in minority populations yes. in the Northeast especially. Uh, he came to Vermont, as he said, to, to go skiing and just fell in love with the place and stayed. Sure. Uh, anything in the works to reach out to that? I, I know that the, um, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development has done some work on the diversity issue, and I imagine that we'll be looking more at that again this year to make sure that um, we're becoming a more diverse population and benefiting from uh, the cultural richness that would come with that. I think that's a pretty exciting idea. Uh, just having been in Boston for the weekend and riding on the trolley and just seeing the variety of people. Uh, but I was going to say that in Brattleboro, there's some pretty exciting things going on that are attracting young people. Some uh, businesses that, uh, when I was out campaigning, I ran into somebody, oh, I just moved to town. Oh, where are you working? You know, and finding out that these people coming here, they're co-working spaces. And one of the things that I really am interested in, I'd like to do, is to have better uh, subsidized child care. Mm -hmm. Not just for low-income people, but I think that that would really help bring young people here you can live in Montreal and pay about $12 a day per child. Mm -hmm. And that's because they want to attract young people. They want them to live there. So it just seems like, you know, we're, we're always sort of thinking, we can't afford to do this, we can't afford to do that. But, but the impact of that, can you imagine, you know, if, if Vermont were advertised as, hey, raise your family in Vermont, you can get really good child care, good quality child care. Yeah that's affordable because it's not affordable right now. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And one of the pieces I'm trying to emphasize more and more is I think one of the ways to get to there is to raise the pay of the people who do this work. Uh, the, right. One of the problems is it's expensive for parents, but it's also most of the workers are very low paid. And I think we would be able to attract and keep quality staff if we focus as much on paying them more too. And there's gonna be a, a, the Blue Ribbon Commission on right. Uh, right. early education is gonna be reporting to us and it'll be interesting to see what their recommendations Absolutely. are. Because this is an economic driver, childcare has been.
I just um, saw, I was just at the post office, I just saw Chad Simmons of Building Bright Futures, and they've been working to produce that report about the, the lack of quality child care mm -hmm. right. for, for, you know, I forget what percentage of, of Vermont children, and that's an issue that they are really trying to make lawmakers uh, aware of. I, I don't think that's a secret to anyone. What I think it's forgotten, though, is it is expensive for parents, but on the other side of it, it's not expensive because the workers are getting paid too much. Right. They're getting paid way too right. little. So I'm hoping we, that doesn't get lost in the sauce. Yeah, here. absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Uh, when Senator Ballot and Senator White were here, uh, housing was an issue that came yeah. up and touched so many sectors, yeah. uh, not just more housing because we have yeah. homeless and, and people living in sub, uh, less than what they, but it's an economic driver. It's a barrier to attracting younger people. Yeah. Is anything going to be coming out of your committee in that regard? Well, I, I know we had a bill last year that didn't go through, and it was specifically on uh, workforce housing. So I think we're going to be bringing that up again this year. Um, and I actually just came from a meeting with um, Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation's Laura Sibelia, a fellow rep, and um, Aaron O'Keefe, who did the Tiny House Festival. And we were talking about, um, you know, the possibility of tiny houses being used as affordable housing for uh, workforce and actually attracting young people to the state, um, you know, making that part of the package, the economic kind of development package that might help recruit them. Mm -hmm. So, um, we're talking about maybe doing a survey. I guess the Lake Champlain Chamber of Commerce has done a survey of young professionals trying to find out what their housing needs are. And uh, we're talking about doing a statewide survey of young professionals, including like people, uh, seniors, you know, graduating from college and that sort of thing of what kind of housing they need and what they'd be able to pay and would they consider a tiny house and that sort of thing. So that's one thing that we're considering doing. And we also want to do a pilot project, a tiny house pilot project here in Brattleboro. Great. Just um, Aaron's working on zoning with Rod Francis. She actually uh, built a tiny house herself um, and um, making sure that our zoning, when we're ready to do that sort of thing, um, is uh, amenable to tiny house development. So uh, so that's something that's exciting and um, I think we're pretty well aware of uh, housing affordability. Also last session we did a um, tax incentive. Um, actually it was a down payment employment assistance um, program. Five th if you are a young person and you're buying your first home you can get five thousand um, dollars toward that um, toward that home and then you pay it back when you sell or uh, refinance your home. So so that's in place? That's in place now and, and people can uh, how, talk How do people to find out about that? The Vermont um, Housing and Finance Agency, okay. VHFA, uh, which is up in Burlington. But um, yeah, we've I think we've like done 60 or 70 of those. Oh, so it's proved popular. It's proved popular and um, yeah, we set it up so it's a five-year revolving loan. So um, yeah, so I think, you know, we're working on it. We're clear that we need um, affordable housing, good child care, good wages. Those are the three things we really need to uh, attract high quality well, workers. Often people can afford the mortgage. That down payment is, uh, is the hard those, part. Those upfront costs are the yeah. hard part. And the other thing we really need and are working on, and BDCC is working really hard on this, and we on the Commerce Committee are working with them, is workforce development. Um, matching, you know, uh, employers with workers who have the skills to do the jobs they need. And um, so um, one of the things Laura was actually saying just at this meeting just now was that maybe we could do a pilot project around in this area that would show how um, service providers for low-income people and that sort of thing can actually help funnel people to through the process of becoming marketable and employable. So we're, we're talking about trying to coordinate those services better. I guess there's a real lack of coordination between um, anti-poverty programs and uh, workforce development programs. So um, those are some other things we're working on. It's interesting though, one of the problems that we have, if you want to call it a problem, is, is low unemployment. Uh, we have one of the lowest unemployment rates in the country. Mm -hmm. And so employers are kind of scrambling 
right. sometimes for, for the best workers. Right. Um, I think it's a challenge we'd like to have, but uh, that comes back to attracting people from outside the state. Right. Yeah. Right. Young people. Yeah. Yeah. Because we have older people moving into Vermont, but younger people moving out. So even though it's pretty flat in terms of Vermont's population going up or down, the people who are moving in are not people who are going to be filling the jobs of the future. Mm -hmm. They're wonderful. We're glad they're here, but <laughs> we need some of those future professionals to move in. Yeah. Um, what other issues outside of your committee have, have you been hearing from constituents about that are important as we move ahead to the 2017 session? I think there's just a general feeling of, you know, the economy mm -hmm. and how do we, you know, we're sort of, the, of course, we, you know, people haven't seen their incomes go up, even though we're sort of crawling out of the recession. And I think there's just a lot of concern about that and how are we going to, affordability over the long, over the long haul. Mm -hmm. How are people going to afford to stay in their homes? How are people going to uh, have their incomes go up? Things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, there's certainly the issue of, of taxes. I'm, I'm pretty excited to hear the report about whether if we move to an income-based property tax, what the impact of that would be. Mm -hmm. That would be very exciting. Because as we all know, people are paying People in I mean, middle-income people are paying a higher percentage of their income in property taxes than people who are wealthier. Yeah. And and don't so, we already have a percentage of a very high percentage of people that who pay based on income? With, we do, but yeah. there's still that cliff that we've seen all yeah. those graphs of the cliff where you fall off the cliff and you're you're paying. So I mean, I think yeah. that the 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 um, projection was that we could sort of save $80 million or something mm -hmm. with, with going to a pro, uh, an income-based property tax for everybody. So I think that that's supposed to be reported to the legislature in yeah. January. So I'll be interested to see what that might bring. That might bring some, you know, certainly could bring some tax relief to some people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the other thing that people are concerned about is, you know, the number of people who are needing state services. And then, of course, the opiate. Yeah. Problem. I mean, that to me is, uh, we've had we had a, a break in in our neighborhood the yeah. other day, yeah. and I think it's happening all over the place. And how do we adequately address that? I was just talking to somebody who's a an expert in in opiate treatment, and it's just like you've got to have on demand treatment. And how do we afford that? Yeah. And yet, how do we how can we yeah. can we afford not to yeah. do that? So I think that's going to be something that we're going to have to really talk about a lot. And, and I have to give the governor, outgoing governor, credit for um, him, for the fact that he raised that issue several years ago. And everybody was sort of like, oh, whoa, do we want to talk about that in Vermont? But it's, yeah. it's here, and it's, it's a very, and I'm sure you see it in your work all the time, Mike. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I'm going to be talking about, uh, we talk about sometimes looking up river for where the problem really is. Mm -hmm. And uh, what my experience is working with children and families, and it's just been affirmed in the last couple of years, is underlying those problems of addiction, mental health, mm -hmm. uh, is untreated trauma. Right. Mm -hmm. When you look at the link in generational poverty, there's usually a trauma. Uh, I mean, and by that I mean uh, a child witnessed the fa their father being murdered. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is significant trauma. There's a book called The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog. If people want to get a sense of what is at the roots of a lot of the problems for people, uh, the, the enormous weight that trauma puts on people's lives, and now with the study of epigenetics, they're saying these traumas, I mean, th these studies were first done with Holocaust survivors and their uh, subsequent um, relations. Uh, trauma moves, moves from generation to generation, and I think it's one of the key parts that keeps people locked into generational poverty. And, and unless we can get effective trauma, and this is where people like you come in, because the body, arts, that's the level that trauma gets treated on most effectively. And uh, there's some lots of different ways, and one of the guests we're going to have subsequently here is Dr. Marty Strauss in town here, mm -hmm. who's got another book on, 
on treating trauma. She primarily works with adolescents. Um, but I think if we, if we want to keep looking upstream to where the real problems are, we need to start looking at trauma. And Mike, one of the bills I think that has a uh, great potential promise for that is um, we have a doctor in the house, as you both are well aware, George Till. Yeah. And he has sponsored this bill, and I think it's a really great idea, which talks about ACE or adverse childhood experiences and, you know, indicates that if a child has a certain number or more traumatic factors sure. from substance abuse to emotional abuse to, you know, the one you mentioned, witnessing violence and that sort of thing, it's very apt to affect their their development uh, or lack thereof. Well, I think the Dr. Till comes from a place of physical health and right. the studies are showing later in life it actually manifests in physical disease. Right, exactly. And it's another reason we need to look at this. Um, but Right, so I think that'll be a really great thing if that can be used as a tool to yep. evaluate what an individual has gone through and therefore what adverse after effects it has left them with so that we can start to treat those earlier yep. before they become major roadblocks the, to a person's success and future health. And I think this gets into another issue of um, uh, incarceration mm -hmm. and tra you know, trauma and how that may lead to incarceration. And uh, I think as a co-chair of the Women's Caucus, we've been very concerned about, about women in the correctional system. And the majority of people of women in the correctional system are nonviolent offenders. And do they really need to be there? Could we do better? And I think this is one of the things we're going to be looking at the legislature is, you know, in terms of the results-based accountability. Couldn't we provide child care, job training, et cetera, for a lot of these people who came, had adverse childhood experiences. Right. There was an amazing article in the New York Times yesterday by Nicholas Kristof about, about women in, in prison and, you know, women who were victims of the sort of three, three strikes you're out laws who are in for drug addiction and things like that. Yep. And they're just a product of generational poverty, uh, addiction, et cetera. And it's just so sad. Mm -hmm. And I think that we could do better we could save money and do better yeah. societally by, by thinking of alternatives to nonviolent incarceration. In this regard, one of the things I believe we need to start naming also is the role sexual violence plays in the roles of women who are incarcerated especially, that it becomes, uh, it gets the snowball rolling down the hill and where they're victimized again and again and then victimized within the, within the correction system. That um, and I, again, I think if, if we don't start naming these things, we're not going to deal with them in the ways that we, we need to do so effectively. And uh, that's a huge piece of this. Um, it also touches education and how we have really good outcomes from our educational system right now. However, there continues to be that performance gap. And we've been talking about this for years. And for the most part, it's children who are growing up uh, in, in poverty, who are growing up in, in terrible situations, tough situations, and they're impacting how much we spend on education, sometimes impacting, um, going back to, to what I was saying before, these are children of trauma in many cases, and, and until we get them effectively uh, in, in treatment that, that works for them, uh, the challenges are going to be there. Taking a little bit of a turn, uh, Vermont Yankee has been yeah. something on, on all our minds for decades, really. Yeah. Uh, it's been closed down, and now there seems to be some idea of a plan to... Expedite the cleanup. To, uh, what are you hearing about that? Uh, it, I think we're going to find out more this week, okay. right? There's a meeting on Thursday night yep. of the um, yeah. decommissioning. Yeah. yeah. I think it's exciting. Yeah. Um, I think the governor's right. We have to make sure that the company that wants to take over the contract has the funds to handle unforeseen, yep. uh, you know, if, if it's harder to clean up and if they confront problems, do they have, you know, the money on hand to address those concerns? So I think they'll need to be carefully vetted. But I think it would be great to do a faster decommissioning. I think it would, you know, uh, mitigate the economic hit this area will take keep more people employed for longer. And who knows what's going to happen in whatever it is, 2070 or something, when I, I think we'll all breathe a little easier when they can move the um, spent fuel out of the 
Yeah. Spent fuel pool and put it into casks. So sooner the better, right? Sooner the better. But I think that you have to wait. I think there has to be a cooling down period. So I think, but that's, you know, obviously part of it. So we've only got a couple minutes left. This is the time of year when if people want something passed, if they have ideas for a bill or questions, get in touch with us. Uh, what's the best way to get in touch with you? For me? Yeah. Uh, my email, mburke at leg.state.vt.us, or you can call my home number at 802-257-4844. Yeah. And, and the best uh, one for me is uh, the same uh, legislative address as Molly, uh, except my la last name. So it's V Stewart, S T U A R T, at ledge.state.vt.us. And um, they could, or they could call my cell phone, which is 802 338 6578. And now's the time if you have ideas. Absolutely. And I think also to stress that people should be in touch with us throughout the session. Yeah. Right. And a lot of times things are happening that we may not know about. We're in our own committees and you meet somebody. And if somebody gets in touch with us through email, you can also call the sergeant at arms office during the session uh, to let us know how you're feeling about something because we want to hear from people. We don't want to be acting in a vacuum. And I think we really need to think about all voices. How are we going to... Um, be legislators for all of our constituents and to balance all the needs and all the different ideas that people have. Absolutely. And also, for example, I, I got contacted today uh, by someone whose elderly mother didn't get their seasonal fuel assistance. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing that we can help with. Uh, if something like that's happening, if you're having issues with medical insurance, you can give us a call. Uh, hopefully we can open some doors or get some questions answered for you, but I think that constituent work is... That's important. one of the nicest parts of our job is when you can actually help somebody yeah. with something like getting fuel assistance. Yeah, you know, and, yeah and it's one of the nicest yeah. parts of Vermont, which is people really can contact us and we can really get in touch yeah. quickly with uh, the right people and make things happen quickly if they're within our purview. Yeah. You can't solve all problems. No, right? absolutely, yeah. but if they're legislatively related. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and thank looking you, forward to a, another productive session. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you again to the people here at BCTV for making it possible to bring our work to you and to make that connection possible. Uh, until next time, this is Mike Merwicki. Bye-bye now. Mm -hmm.